Hey everyone, this is Mike Andes, and you're listening to the Business Bootcamp Podcast. Today, I'm going to be doing an interview on the show. Haven't done that for a very long time. It's actually part of the local leaders project that we're doing within our local community, and I'm interviewing some of the iconic brands and business owners in our area. We're going to create a book and just kind of create more awareness around these stories and these entrepreneurs in our local community. And so uh, you might have heard me talk about that, the book we're putting together and all of that, but I wanted to share this one. Uh, This audio today was an interview. It's going to be a raw audio file. You're going to actually hear someone come into the office and talk to the owner and things like that. It's very raw. It's more, I I wasn't planning on using this for the podcast. I was planning on just using this for the book and being able to use this as a way to synthesize and put together the book. However, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal interview, and I wanted to share it with you today. So before we get into the, today's show and exactly who we're going to be interviewing, I want to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, which is Gusto, uh, that has really stepped to the plate, sponsored the show, allowed me to really help many of you start, grow, and save your business. And if you have a question, go to, go to businessbootcamppodcast at gmail.com. You can email me there or the website. Reach out to me. And Gusto is a big part of sponsoring that, and they've given all of us the opportunity to test their software out their employee payroll and benefit software for 90 days completely free. And even once after the free trial is done, it's a lot cheaper than a lot of alternatives out there and a whole lot cheaper than having your own account. So check it out. Go to gusto.com slash bootcamp for that exclusive 90-day trial. That's G-U-S-T-O dot com slash bootcamp. Now, today I'm going to be interviewing Paul Akers. And Paul is, is local to my area, so sometimes it's easy to look over the local business leaders in your area because of, you know, podcasts and everything that's made the big A-list sort of entrepreneurs so popular. So I, I've just really enjoyed interviewing a lot of them recently, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go over what Paul has done. He's going to share his story today in the podcast episode and on this interview. However, you know, one of the things that, you know, we don't talk a whole lot is that Paul was listed among the top three industry thought leaders in the world in the entire world, along with Elon Musk and Richard Branson, by the Business Transformation and Operational Excellence World Summit Report in 2017. He actually ran for Senate uh, as public office, and I think today you're going to hear a little bit why he did that. Uh, and so FastCap is the name of the business that he has created, and, it's an, and it basically creates, uh, specializes in woodworking tools, innovations, and hardware for professional builders and wood artisans. And so it has thousands of distributors across the entire country, or sorry, entire world, worldwide in over 40 countries. And Paul has published several different uh, books on lean And so you might have heard about lean management, the Toyota way, uh, how to do this whole manufacturing process in a very lean manner. But he's taken it really to a whole different level and really created a lean lifestyle, a lean way of thinking, a lean way of looking at your health, a lean way at traveling, and really implementing the thoughts of lean and the processes of lean into not only his business concepts, but his entire life. And so today we're going to be talking about that, digging deep into that. If lean is something that you want to get to know more about after today's show, since we don't talk a whole lot about what lean means, I highly recommend his book. It's Two Second Lean. It's very simple. It's not like uh, super high in the clouds theoretical. It's very actionable, very simple, easy read. It's on Audible, and you can get it on Amazon. So let's go ahead and jump into today's uh, recording. Again, this is just raw audio. I wasn't planning on using this for the podcast. And so uh, I just hope that you get something out of it and can kind of learn from this great mind when it comes to manufacturing and lean management, but also just in life and all the experiences that he brings. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. Paul Akers from Fast Cap and the author of Two Second Lean. You know, I developed a product for the lawn care industry that is freaking the best thing out in the What's whole that? world. What's that? It's called the Kaizen Rake. I might have one here. I know I have one here. So basically, I have the most, uh, you, you haven't seen my house or you haven't seen a picture no. yet. I have the most outrageous yards ever. <laughs> and uh, they're beautiful Japanese gardens. Everything's meticulous. And when you're raking through the planter to rake out the weeds, and then when you get a weed, what do you got to do? You got to stop, get a hula hoe, pick it out, do the whole thing. Yeah. I put the hula hoe on the back of the rake. So all you do is flip the rake, hula hoe it, and then keep raking. You never bend over, you never stop. <laughs> it's, That's awesome. Did you just tape it? 
Is that what well, you did? Yeah, well, I did initially, but no, yeah. it's all, no, it's a product. You, really? Oh, oh that's no, super it's cool. Like, it's epic. It's like, I would never even garden without it. I mean, I don't know how anybody does what they do. Yeah. It's that good. Yeah. Well, like in the book, you talk about the the thing you did for cleaning out the the bottom of your mower. Oh yeah, yeah, the bidet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the whole my whole lawn cares. So everything to do with the gardens <laughs> is just so like outrageous. It's like uh, everything's cool. Yeah, like um, you know, it kind of comes to some of my questions, which this is sort of how the interview goes, by the way. Yeah. Um, but like, it kind of goes back to my my main question after reading your book and kind of looking in a lot about lean and things was where's that line. For example, the, the lawn mower example. How long did it take you to build it versus how long does it take save What's you the benefit? each time? Right. Like, right, right, like right, it's right. kind of like ROI on money, right? People are looking for a certain cap rate or return. Right. Like what's that balance? Oh, it's the simplest question in the world. It has nothing to do with return on investment. Mm -hmm. It has to do with learning. So everything we do for improvements is based on what we learn from the experience, not what we gain from it in terms of monetarily. So when I did the, the experiment, for instance, with the bidet for the thing, heck, I might have spent 40 hours screwing with it by the time we poured the concrete and everything. But I learned about plumbing, but I learned about what the best way is to get the grass off the bottom of the lawnmower. I learned so many things that apply to so many other things that I do in life. It enriches my whole life and my ability to solve problems. Well, That's why we do lean. Right. Well, would you say, though, to a business owner, say, is like scrapped? And you're like, well, I can't spend the 40 hours. Well, you're strapped because you haven't, made, you haven't wrestled in your mind with the philosophy and the idea of long-term thinking. So there is no short-term game with lean. It's very rare that you're going to get an immediate short-term. You will. So this is why the Japanese are so successful. It's because they don't look at what they're going to gain from it now. They think of the development of their culture for the future. So... When we, make, when we spend an hour and a half every day here before anybody works, we improve, clean our facility, uh, have a morning meeting for an hour and a half every day. We've been doing it for like 15 years. It's cost me millions of dollars to do it. Mm -hmm. We do that because we have 40 people here that can produce what 300 people can produce. Mm -hmm. And I'm serious about that. Yeah. They're that good. Right. So it's not even... We, you don't have the time because you're not spending the time, you're not investing the time. It's just like real estate. You know, you buy a house, you don't buy a house, you don't get a return on investment immediately. Mm -hmm. You buy a house and three, four, five years, ten years, a stream of income comes. So it's all long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was interested by your story too, just starting out, coming out of college, you were doing a lot of woodworking mm -hmm. and you started working for Taylor, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Taylor for the guitars. He's a good friend of mine. Tell me about, like, was that, a, you think, sort of inbreeding into you precision and really looking at the craft of things? Uh, Bob inbred in me the idea of being an innovator in spite of what everybody else thinks. So what Bob did was he did a lot of crazy ideas. He introduced some crazy ideas into the music industry. And the number one thing he did was he bolted the neck onto an acoustic guitar. Up to that point in history, in the world, they had always been put on with a dovetail joint, hmm. a woodworking joint. Right. And he said, well, it's too difficult to put it on, it's too difficult to take it off, too difficult to adjust the neck and do a precise job. Mm -hmm. So he said, let's bolt it on, and that was not the orthodoxy to do that, and everyone said, you can't do that, we're woodworkers, we're not, me we're not mechanics. And Bob said, but it doesn't make any sense what you're doing. So everybody rejected what he was trying to do, and Bob didn't care. He wanted to innovate and solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I watched that whole process happen, and that changed my mind about innovation. So I quit caring about what you thought, what anybody thought about me. I just said, I want to learn. I want to, I want to run an experiment. I want to see what comes out of it. And don't be pressured by what the orthodoxy of the industry is. So for instance, in the lawn industry, the orthodoxy of the, uh, the lawn industry is you have a hula ho, yeah. right? And you have a rake. <laughs> and that's just the way we do it, yeah. right? Don't tell me there's another way. Yeah. And, I, and I would look at that. If I wasn't taught by Bob Taylor, I would have said, well, you know, that's the way we do it. That's the way the pros do it. Yeah. That's stupid. Why do we have two tools? We can do it with one and never bend over. Yeah. That's what Bob taught me. Yeah. And you mentioned, too, how it was more about the experience and, like, didn't even mention the money side of things. When I hear about lean a lot of times and it's business money. owners, that's the reason they're even thinking it's about the word, it. That's why they always fail. Yeah. That's why lean always fails. Mm -hmm. It always fails with every company that makes it about the money. It always fails. Never, right. never lasts. 
So of the companies that come to you, for example, for advice, mm -hmm. and they're looking to improve lean, what's the, something you would kind of talk about to make sure that's not their number one? <laughs> I would say if you're not doing this because you want to improve the quality of lives of your people, don't waste my time. I'm not going to even spend one second with you. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. And you will fail if you do it for any other reason because everybody fails. Yeah. What was your kind of exposure to entrepreneurship before even like Taylor or any of that? Were you already oh, that's a great in your question. mind already? Yeah. Yes, I was an entrepreneur from the very beginning. I was mowing lawns when I was a young, young, I mean, 10 years old. I was a member on my hands and knees. We used to edge with a pair of hands. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the well, edging? You're, yeah, you're much younger than me. Oh, right? So we did all the edging. And then finally they came out with, I think, a corded weed whacker. <laughs> and then we went to a corded weed whacker. Actually, they came up with a corded ch -ch -ch shear. Really? You know, and then, then we went to a corded weed whacker. And then finally they got gas powered ones. And that was, <laughs> that was Nirvana, you know? Oh, wow. So yeah, I was mowing lawns. I delivered newspapers, and then the biggest thing I did was I sold flowers on the corner in National City in San Diego. So mm -hmm. every day after junior high school, I was picked up mm -hmm. by a van, which they would never do nowadays, that's crazy, but the four or five kids would pile into this van, this guy we didn't even know, well, we knew him after a while, he'd drop us off with a bucket, a five gallon bucket with flowers, and for five bucks a bouquet, we would sell them, and we'd make like a dollar a bouquet, and I was, I was making so much money I couldn't even see straight. Huh. I was making 70 bucks a day. Wow. And I was in junior high school, and that was in 19, it was 60, 60, 70, 1973, 1972. Yeah. I was making that much money. So coming out of high school, did you know already that's what you wanted to do? I did. Be a business owner yeah, uh, Yes, because that's a very, man, you're asking great questions, Mike. So what happened to me was, you know, I came from a very middle class, lower middle class family, didn't have much money. And so... On the weekends and in the evenings, we would ride our bikes, which we had cobbled together with scraps, up to a place called Convoy Street, and, behind, and there was all these bike stores, and we would dig through the trash and get bike parts so we could rebuild our bikes and make them better, because that's all we could afford. We could never buy a new Schwinn bike or anything like that. Yeah. Great story. But so uh, there was this one business owner called, I don't know what the guy's name was, but it was called the Fun Bike Center, and they sold motorcycles. And they had lots of good stuff in their trash, but it was a little tiny <laughs> fledgling business, and we'd get motorcycle parts and old handlebars and grips and things like that. And I always rode by his shop on my bike, and I saw this guy interacting with a customer, selling a bike, and I, I just, I go, I want to be that guy someday. I don't know, for some reason it just appealed to me. He was, you know, doing business, right? Yeah. And so I just loved that whole thing. And now that business is massive. Really? If you go down to San Diego, it's one of the biggest motorcycle shops I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. And he st I remember starting off just a little tiny shop and now it's this mega place. Hmm. So he was my vision for what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so you obviously were working with your hands a lot, everything from oh, the woodworking yeah, yeah, yeah. to that. <clears throat> and it's interesting, too, that you took his waste, because that's mm -hmm. kind of the yeah, whole yeah, purpose yeah, yeah. of oh, I never thought about it. That's right? exactly right, yeah. Really creating something it's out of It's actually interesting that his waste, yeah, he inspired me, and it was his waste that I was digging through. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. I never yeah. thought about it. Good connection. Very cool. Um, so coming you know, after Taylor, tell us kind of how you got into Fast Cap. I know you were already in woodworking. Right. But so, like, how did that kind of evolve? So after Taylor Guitars, I worked for Bob for a couple years. We built the first 2,000 guitars that came out of that plant, and it was just an amazing experience. And then I decided to go back. Well, actually, right after that, uh, it's a great story you might want to know, but uh, I was working at a gas station for, you know, I don't know, two bucks an hour, yeah, whatever yeah. it was. And then the opportunity came up to work for Bob. And I went to Bob and I worked for $2 an hour for two, for two years and they gave me a raise to $2.05 an hour. I think I started at $1.95 an hour and then it got to $2.05 after two years, which was wonderful. I had no problem with any of that. And my next job, I went to work for a finished carpenter making 25 bucks an hour. Now you gotta remember how long ago this was. You gotta Whoa. think about it. even 25 bucks an hour is a lot today. Yeah. So Bob, what Bob taught me, the skills were mine. And when I, I, anywhere I went, I just said, I worked for Bob Taylor. They go, ah, oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. And I'd walk into a shop and I knew more skills than anybody yeah. because of what Bob taught me. So I owe everything to Bob. Bob, I owe everything to you, okay? <laughs> what would you say, just to stop yeah. there, like what would you say to someone, for instance, coming out of school, having a passion like that, willing to take the two dollars over say four dollars but for the experience smartest thing you'll ever do mm -hmm. it has my, life has nothing to do with money mm -hmm. and ne it was never about money for me mm -hmm. it was always about learning yeah and like with bob i mean two bucks an hour i mean come on 
I mean, it, didn't, it didn't, had nothing to do with it. It had to be what Bob could teach me and how mm -hmm. I could learn and develop myself. And yeah, always the experience, always the learning over money. Mm -hmm. Money is the biggest corrupter ever. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with money in and of itself, but if you chase money, money is the byproduct product of doing things well. You probably have to agree with me. Yeah. You run a good business, you make money. You know, you're not going to make money just because you're in business. You're going to run, make money because you run a good business. So the focus should be on the development of your processes, your people, and your organization. And if you do that effectively, you're going to make money. It's almost impossible not to. Did you sort of learn from Bob the kind of that business aspect of the hands-on building aspect? Because there's lots of people that build and put stuff together, but they have no connection with leadership or making an organization. Bob taught me everything. I mean, yeah. he taught me leadership, he taught me discipline, he taught me creativity, he taught me innovation, and he has no degree. He didn't go to school or anything. He's a very simple guy, mm -hmm. but he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. So the idea of fast kept come during that time and then you no, left there? No, what happened was, yeah, it didn't answer your question. So I went to work for a finished carpenter, worked for that guy for a couple years, and then I went back and got my degree when I was about 21 years old, 20 years old, I went back to Biola University, got a degree in education, wanted to be a teacher, a pastor, right. things like that. Yeah. So then I did that and I got out of, I got out of school and I got a job um, at, a, at teaching industrial arts. And so I love teaching, I love the kids, I love, I love the whole learning environment, but I hated the bureaucracy because the school system's so screwed up, it's mind blowing. It was screwed up back then, it's so screwed up now, I can't even see straight, so it's yeah. not even, we're not even teaching kids, but yeah. another subject. So I left after two years and then started my own contracting business, building cabinets, furniture, things like that in San Diego. And then my wife and I moved up to Bellingham because we wanted a better quality of life. We wanted to live in the mountains. We wanted to live in this whole serene instead of the big city and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started a, a company up here, Genauer European Cabinets, started building cabinets. Very difficult because I had a pretty good clientele down there with money and there was no money in Bellingham when I moved up here. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big challenge. And then one night in my shop, I was working, trying to cover all these screw holes and I came up with the idea on how to make this peel and stick cover cap. And my wife and I, our hope was to make maybe $5,000 extra a year so we'd go on vacation because it was a one income. My wife stayed home with the kids. I worked, didn't have a lot of excess income. I think I made like $35,000, $40,000 a year back then. It was very, you know, we didn't make a lot of money, but you know, we, were, we were happy and comfortable, but it would have been nice to make a little extra. And FastCap started, and we started in my house, and today it's all over the world, 40 countries. So there was that p kind of pivotal moment, though, when FastCap was successful, mm -hmm. doing well. I remember and it well. And then the idea of lean, and that was introduced to you. Three years after that. What sort of humility did it take to accept the fact that you were considered successful by most people's degree, but now you're taking this big step back or changing your complete perspective. Well, I tell you, you, you know, I'll, I'll put the question back to you. How many business owners do you know that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour with yeah. their new startup company, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then somebody comes in and tells you that you're, you're freaking clueless and you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. And tell then, us about how that happened. Yeah, so what happened was, I'm a very OCD person, and this is the big deception that happens with lean. People like me who are OCD and everything's organized and everything's perfect think that they're lean. They, have ne they don't know anything about lean. Zero, 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 and I can't emphasize that mm -hmm. because nobody was more OCD than me. My floor in my shop where we made the laser jam and the fast cap, it was painted gray. It was perfect. You could eat off the floor. It was so perfect. It was a manufacturing plant. Yeah. I mean, it was perfect. <laughs> Everything was labeled. It looked lean, so to speak, but it was the most wasteful environment ever because we were making 100 laser jams at a time. We were making 100,000 fast caps when they only had an order for 1,000. We would just run the machine because the setup time was clunky. We'd run the machine, put it on the shelf. We thought it looked really nice. I remember, I thought it looked so good to have all the fast caps all dialed in, everything perfectly in a row, everything labeled. I walk up, this is my product, boom, I pull one for there. You want one of those? You want? I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. And the Japanese looked at that and said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And so the, the question you asked me was, how, well, how much humility will you think about it? I have a perfect shop. I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Everybody looks at me and says I'm a genius. Everybody wants to invest in the company. And the Japanese come in and say, you're clueless? At first, did you just say, like, I got No, I told them you were full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to beep it out, whatever you have to do. Yeah, I told them they were full of it. I told, yeah. them, I told them, you know, 
look at dude. I'm older than you. Yeah. The guy were young kids, yeah. right? I said, number one, I'm older than you. Number two, I make more money than you. Number three, I'm a, I'm a finished carpenter. I'm a master craftsman. I'm a luthier, and you haven't done anything. Yeah. And I set up this whole shop and figured out how to build these machines and did everything. And you're telling me I don't know what I'm doing? Basically, that was the attitude. Yeah. And they said, okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. Let us show you just a few things. And I said, okay, but there's no chance you're going to be able to show me anything. In one week, they took my processes that were 45 minutes to five minutes. You moron. Yeah. And then I go, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That's all I needed. I didn't know what I was doing. And I still don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. When do you think there comes a level of complacency, though, with most people's success? Oh, well, you know, again, know if you do lean right. That's a, man, you're asking some really deep questions. Most people don't ask this level of questions. So my kudos to you. Um, if you do lean for the reason of developing yourself and the people around you and improving the sphere of influence of all the human beings that are in your, your world, no, there will be no complacency because you're doing it for absolutely the right reason. But if you're doing it to, to get to a certain level of efficiency, to make a certain amount of money, you know, to please the bank, to please the shareholder, yeah, the complacency will come shortly. When do you think you realized that it was never going to be a finish line, though? Well, it took me five years to even figure out what lean was. So from the time I started lean, from the time the Japanese taught it to me, to the time I actually figured out what Toyota was doing, it took me five years. Mm -hmm. I wandered around the wilderness, even though they showed me how inefficient I was and how to apply lean principles to what I was doing, and I could get some huge wins from it, I got all that. I got the mechanics of it. I really didn't understand what Toyota was doing until five years after. And that moment happened when I was in front of the vice president of Lexus and I asked him a question. I said, what is the most important thing for Toyota? And he said, Paul son, it is not the next engineering fee. It is not the next hybrid. It is not the next manufacturing plant we're opening up somewhere in the world. It's not the next sales program, the next marketing program. None of it matters to Toyota. There's only one thing that matters to Toyota. Building a culture of continuous improvement. Teaching and training our people and building a culture of continuous improvement. And I go, that's what they're doing here. They're not building cars, they're building people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that really effort changed. towards continuous improvement is sometimes lost when a founder, for instance, that gentleman you talked to at Lexus, he goes off the scene and then more leadership. How does that kind of get passed down throughout a culture generationally? Where are these questions coming from? Holy mackerel. <laughs> I've been interviewed. I've never had questions this good. good. Okay. So that happens because of how deep the training goes in the organization. Most companies are content with a few of the brain trusts within the organization understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. Toyota is not. Toyota wants total participation from all 100, 300, 400, 500,000 people worldwide. So if you create an organization where it is absolutely permeated into every cell and corner and everything you do and everything you think, then you don't have to worry about the succession mm -hmm. because every leader has been trained in it so deeply that when that leader moves on, the next leader moves on, they're total lean maniacs. Mm -hmm. When did you kind of make that transition from, okay, I'm making woodworking products to now there's this evolution people. towards lean and what it can do for my people? Well, that, so, so I learned years. lean in 2000. My company started in 1997. Yeah. Three years, the Japanese came in. 2000, I learned it. I wandered in the wilderness for five years and then at 2005, I began to understand what it was. By 2006, 2007, it was, it was crazy because the whole world was coming to FastCap to learn what we were doing. It was, mm -hmm. we, are, we were just nonstop tour after tour after tour. We, I mean, we, we, so thousands and thousands of people have been through mm -hmm. our facility. When did you kind of cross that bridge, though, from being, an edu being educated to becoming an educator? Like, when did you feel like you were the it one was, that it, was... It, it, was in, it was a year after I figured out lean. So yeah. we went five years of wandering the wilderness. I figured out lean. One year of building a culture. That's when I came back from Japan. I said, all I'm going to do is focus on developing my people. 
After one year of developing the people, things were going so well, and then people, everyone was touring, I realized that my real calling, going back to being a pastor, mm -hmm. you know, being a teacher, really that's what my heart is, that my real calling was just teaching people and showing people what we were doing and helping develop other companies around the world. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for industries like mine, for mm -hmm. example, so like we read the book internally, Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the ideas, you know, op caused me to really believe in open book management and showing all the numbers to mm -hmm. frontline employees and all of those things. Um, but when we look at an industry like mine, where every right. single job has so many different variables and differences, and it's not a cut, dry, pr product-driven business that is more of a conveyor belt system. Mm -hmm. For a business like our industry like that, how do you look like a restaurant or however it is, where does lean fit in? You ready for this? Yeah. First, you got to take everything you said and you got to literally sure wash it down the toilet. It's all wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I'm not picking on you because yep. you're a very bright guy. Uh, there is, within every organization, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's brain surgery or mowing a lawn, there are standard set processes that you do every time. Mm -hmm. And your job is to refine those processes and create clear standards where it's done systematically the same way every time so you have a baseline to measure on so you can continue to improve. Mm -hmm. So there is no such thing as an industry that does not apply to. Every industry it applies to, and I can take you, I don't care if it's raking the lawn, I don't care if it's loading the truck, I don't care if it's sharpening the axe, I don't care if it's sharpening the chainsaw, I don't care what it is, there is a process. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is understand that and then start refining those processes and using the genius of your people to do it. Did and, I answer your question? Yeah, and what I like, you talk about the genius of your people. Because I feel sometimes, it feels when I'm talking about lean or thinking about lean, it's almost taking human capital in terms of commoditizing it and reducing it down to how, how much can we get done with one hour of somebody's time. In terms of like looking at them more as a robot, instead of a human individual? Let me think about how to answer that question. So in the way I think of lean, I understand what you're saying. The way I think of lean is I think that I have an obligation to my customer. Mm -hmm. So lean is completely driven by this notion that there is a customer. Mm -hmm. So I have a customer and they're gonna walk in the door and they, what they want from me is they want a high quality product that's on time at a very reasonable price. They don't want me, they don't want to be charged for my inefficiency. Mm -hmm. So when I do lean, I'm doing it from the standpoint, I want to honor my customer, and I teach all my employees and team members, that we're honoring the customer, we're respecting the customer by continually driving out waste and in the process, improving quality. We really do lean. This is a kind of a tough thing to get your head around. We're doing this for the purpose of improving quality quality. Mm -hmm. We're not doing it for the purpose of saving money. When you improve quality, you save money. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because yeah. when you have to rework something, there's a defect, you have to do it over, that costs more money. Mm -hmm. And usually the, the, the actual number is 10 times more. Mm -hmm. So to do something over again is 10 times more expensive than doing it right. Yeah. So we're really, our, our target quality but quality delivers efficiency and better bottom line. Mm -hmm. How do you get your people to buy into that philosophy with, teach them. without having compensation to tied to that? Oh, but, but, well, here's, okay, first, that's a, another, another great question. So I get this question quite a bit, but I like the way you phrased it better. So, first of all, if you were coming to work for me right now, I would say, Mike, you have to understand something. I am not hiring you to make woodworking tools. I'm hiring you to improve the way we make woodworking tools. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. That is your job. Your job is to think lean 24 seven. That is your job. It is not to make woodworking tools. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you'll make the best woodworking tools, you'll make them more efficient, everyone's gonna win. So I never pay people for improvements. It's the biggest mistake you'll ever make. Never, ever, ever, no bonus system, nothing. Every person in that facility there makes a minimum of 30% more than industry standards. Some of them make twice as much. They are so well paid, it is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But of course, why can we do that? Mm -hmm. Because 40 people do the work of 300. Yeah. So they are naturally compensated. 
for their wonderful work. But it's not like, oh, Mary made an improvement, oh, I'm gonna give her this. Mm -hmm. This is just the entire culture is full of improvements and everybody is just. Yeah. Was there ever a moment you doubted lean though? Or like in the evolution, the process of starting it and implementing it, where you're like, you know what, this is gonna cost too much, it's gonna take me too long, or technology is gonna wipe this out anyways. Like, was there mm. ever a doubt? You're gonna be shocked by this. Never once ever. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I was in it. I mean, I'm doing an interview real quick. Do you want us to close the door, please? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm doesn't sorry. Matter. No problem. Everyone was just saying, I thought Volcano would be <laughs> um, So the question was, was there ever a time I doubted lean? Absolutely not. Never, not even for a millisecond. And let me tell you why. Because I thought I was really good. And I was really good because everything I did turned to gold, whether it be I was investing in real estate, building guitars, building furniture, running a company. I mean, I was really pretty, very successful compared to my peers. Mm -hmm. And everybody told me so all the time. When I went to Japan and saw Toyota and saw Lexus, it was as though I, I didn't have a head. I didn't even know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. They're that good. So I understood when I saw what they were doing, how it was so, it wasn't a little bit better than me. It, we weren't even on the same planet. It's that good. I take people who run billion dollar organizations in Japan, because I lead Japan study missions all the time. And they're, they're running the best companies in the world. And I take them to Japan, they're practically crying when they walk out, they're, they're, they're that bad. Mm -hmm. So when I saw what Toyota and Lexus was doing, I said, oh, I want that. I knew that it was doable because they had done it. So I never even doubted it for one second. I struggled. I cussed. I swore. I, you know, I was pissed. I couldn't figure out why I was doing wrong. But never for one second did I ever think I'm going to go another direction. You know, because what they had was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, you're writing a book and finishing it up about right. life lean. Right. My question is this, is for someone like a business owner that can come to a, a company like this and control all the different variables of the business to make it more lean, but then go to their personal life where there's other people involved, there's personalities, spouse, family members, right. influx, um, and all those variables. Do you see sometimes find the disconnect or hard to switch from a controlled environment where you can go out there and change a process yeah, 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 versus yeah, yeah. you go home and now you have different... Well, ideas. I'll answer that question. It's a great question again. So there is only one line that delineates what you're talking about, and that is family. So when you marry someone and when you have children, it's, there's a different dynamic, mm -hmm. okay? And I made this mistake. I went home and pushed it on my wife, pushed it on my kids, and they hated me. The salt hate. and pepper oh, label. They, 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 hate, they, hate, they hate me. They, they, you know, they just hated me. That's all there is to it. And was that like 2004, 2005? Like I, I don't think there? they started. I, I don't think they started appreciating me until about a year and a half ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. Really? I'm really? dead serious. Both they, my whole family works here. My my daughter, my son, everybody. Oh. My son's a lean maniac. He's incredible. He, he gets it. But he yelled and cussed at me and told me I was no good enough, sort of a, you know, the whole night. They yeah. hated me, yeah. right? And that was my fault because I forced it on them. And what I should have done is just shut my mouth and just done my thing And if they wanted to do it. Lean is based on pull, not on push. You can never push it on anyone. Mm -hmm. So the one caveat is home. Now, the delineating line is this. I don't let anyone into my world unless they think like this. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna become my friend. I'm not gonna spend any time with you unless you get continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I would never waste my time, mm -hmm. right? I, I too much to do than yeah. to drag you through this thing. What would you say to someone that's already in a relationship that, with someone that's not with that mindset? Is there a way to foster yes. it? Yes, here's what I would do. I, I, would, I, would, I would have that, Centauri moment, this is a Japanese word for this awakening. I'd have this Centauri moment where you say, oh my gosh, this is gonna solve 99.9% .9 of all my problems and I'm gonna have a great life and things are gonna be wonderful. You say, I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna worry about whether or not Mary wants to do it with me, mm. but I'm gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen over and over again. When you get really good at it and you don't push it, but you just do it and your life is just getting better and it's just like a tornado and you're just going, 
and everything. Mary goes, I want that. I want that. Don't push it on him. Set an extraordinary example, and everyone is just sucked into it. That's the key. Looking at your story, it right? seems very linear. Am I an, did I answer your question? Am yes. I answering your yep. question? No, okay. agree. Not, um, not vague or esoteric. No, no, okay, that's good. good. Uh, linear in terms of you know starting out from the, working with the, ta the Taylor guitars, making now a woodworking product, mm -hmm, being mm -hmm. very successful, growing, mm -hmm. then really scaling with lean and the ideas and all that. Was there ever a moment that wasn't the case, where it didn't feel to you like you were constantly in that real world whirlwind going up, when we thought you might fall out? Uh, no. I would describe my life as pre-lean and post-lean. Pre-lean, compared to my peers, my life was spiraling up upward, mm -hmm. right? I, I could have retired when I was 30 years old. I was a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. It was my target. That's what I did. I invested in real estate. I listened to my dad. My dad told me how to invest in real estate. He didn't give me anything, but I figured it all out. Boom. Yeah. So compared to most people my age, I was just like kicking ass from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So I was always in an upward trajectory, but when I got to lean, it exponential. It went, it went crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I never felt like I was coming out, but here was the difference. When I was pre-lean and I was having success, I was struggling through the whole thing. I didn't know completely what I was doing, but I knew I was doing basically the fundamentals right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I didn't really understand all the mechanics that were going on. When I, when I learned lean, I, I go, oh, now I understand all the pieces. Now everything fits together and everything works. So then I had zero doubt because I had profound knowledge. I had deep understanding of what was really going on. Before, I had knowledge. Mm -hmm. After lean, and I started to understand all the details from Kanban, from push, from pull, from Ondon, from stopping the line, fixing defects, don't passing on defects to the next person, to the development of human beings. I had all the pieces. Mm -hmm. but then there was no chance of ever falling out because n nothing compared to it. Mm -hmm. Is there a risk, though, with lean, you think, in your personal life to constantly be looking for problems and mistakes to fix? It's the joy of life. Mm -hmm. A problem and a mistake is the joy of life. That's how you learn. That's how you develop. Two things happen when you, when you become an extraordinary problem solver. Two things happen. You are developing your brain. So God gave us this amazing brain that's sitting on top of our head. And it's not like any other brain in the animal kingdom, if you will. Okay? Yeah. It does some processing at a very high level. Mm -hmm. You agree with that, right? Yeah. So... God gave us this brain for this high-level processing. Lean is absolutely 100% aligned with what our Creator designed us to do. Mm -hmm. So number one, we're honoring the creation. And number two, by improving, making all these improvements, we're improving the lives of all the people around us. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's pure joy. It's like, it's crazy. I mean, I can't, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. it's so Lean has obviously kind of like infiltrated so many areas of your life. And mm -hmm. you wrote the book about travel for, on a lean. You know, My health? health? I did two which Iron the Man. The book cover yeah. sells it all. Yeah, which one? The health one? The health yeah, yeah, one, the health yeah. One. You're looking at me right, so it's not, I didn't Photoshop it, right? <laughs> but um, when it comes to, you know, business and all these things and, you know, you've accomplished a lot of things, um, what would you say to someone that is looking at their life and they see a lot of waste? whether it be health-wise, in travel, like the, all the different areas you've seen it. And even now you've you know, really started to take even from a government standpoint mm -hmm. and our whole country in terms of looking at waste, where can we identify it, where can we fix those problems? What would you say to someone that says, I have a lot of waste? Because you look at America. Well, I have a lot of waste. Right? And I'm like the lean guru, right? And yeah. I have more waste. I, have, I always tell people I have enough waste and you have enough waste for 10 lifetimes. Forget about the one lifetime. You have enough for 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. What would I tell people? It's just the simplest thing in the world. Fix what bugs you. Mm -hmm. Whatever's bugging you right now, fix it. Mm -hmm. Stop right now and fix it. Do people ever think that you're obsessive about that, though? Oh, people all the time. I don't care. No. I don't care. I have a great life. No. You know, I've been in 102 countries. I travel all over the world. I do whatever I want. You know, I have people calling me from, from the biggest companies in the world asking for my help. I mean, I have zero limits. There's not a single limit in my life. There isn't anything I can't do. There isn't anything. There's nothing. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, 
Yeah, I'm obsessive. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. What can you do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Yeah. What, what kind of ridiculous? Not not from you, but yeah, from yeah. people. I'm just. I laugh. Like, yeah. Go knock yourself out. Yeah. In 2010, you were thinking about kind of going into the politics. Politics. Right. 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 That didn't work out. But like, what is that drive there for? And how do you look at our country and our government? Oh, in terms great, of great. Wow. Again. Wow. Just fabulous questions. So it's real simple. The the key to life is to be grateful. If there's one thing you have to do, Rick Warren says it, it's not about you. You want to have a great life, you have to realize it's not about you. The whole, it's not about you, it's about what you do to give back. So the key to life is to be grateful. Mm -hmm. So I read tons of history books. I know history backwards and forward, whether it be European, Chinese history, Asian history, or American history. And if you're not completely slain by what our founding fathers gave to us, there's something wrong with you. Okay? So I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for the great gift. I would never have been able to do anything if Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Adams, George Washington would not have done what they did. These were all very wealthy, successful people. They risked not only their wealth and fortune, but their life. So they could create a republic, a representative government, so that you and I could have freedom to run our business and to have a family and have freedom. You and I should be are indebted for the rest of our life. So I ran for the US Senate because of my I felt guilty of all the success that I had on the backs of these amazing human beings that gave us this country. And if I did not sacrifice and give and try to make a difference, it would, I would never, I'd go to the grave and I'd be, I'd be miserable. Mm -hmm. So that's why I did it. So this whole project, like my last question is, the whole project's called Local Leaders mm -hmm. in, in Whatcom County specifically. But when you look at what you've done and what you're wanting to do, whether it be mm -hmm. you know, the polit political side or whatever, where, what does leadership mean to you? And when would you say that you've you know, attained to that level? Of leadership. What does that mean to you? Well, leadership means when you come out of your office and you get on the shop floor and you're working shoulder to shoulder with the common person. Mm -hmm. It is not charting the vision of the company. It's going out on the shop floor and allowing, unlocking the ability for your people to do a better job, for you to exercise your power to help them do a better job. Mm -hmm. That is leadership. It is not a vision. It is not making more money. It's not more money on the bottom line. It has nothing to do with that. What would you say to those, to someone that's saying, hey, to get to the next level of my business, whatever, I need to step out of that day-to-day -day or working out on the floor with the you know, labor? Well, it's just the opposite is the case. Mm -hmm. Just the opposite is the case. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at me. I mean, there's only one place I spend my time when I'm here. So it's on the shop floor. I don't even have an office. There's no office here. There's no name badge that says Paul Akers president. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm, my desk is right there on the quad with everybody else. And I'm always on the shop floor working with all my people. Why is that I'm so here. important? Because that's, that's where the value is added. That's what the customer, the customer comes to me because he wants woodworking or they want woodworking products, right? They don't come to me because they want a nice desk with a mahogany desk. You know, they don't want... They don't want any of that. They want woodworking tools. So my job is to provide to make sure they're getting high quality woodworking tools and you do that by working and developing your people. Mm -hmm. That's what the customer wants. Is that what you would want? When you, if you buy a rake or you buy a lawnmower, let's say you buy a lawnmower from Husqvarna or from Toro or whatever, right? Yeah. Do, do you, what, what, when you walk out that lawnmower, you want an amazing lawnmower that's super reliable and does exactly what you want to do, right? Yeah. You don't want an, a mahogany desk and some president sitting in there going to the country club, do you? Is that what you want to pay for? No. no. no you don't want to pay for that. No. So the value is on the shop floor. And most people, the leaders don't figure it. This is only, hey, this is only for 2% of the people in the world. There's, there's a tiny little sliver of people that get this. Yeah, yeah. What's next for you? What's next? Well, my goal is to change the world. Mm -hmm. And the specific goal, how I want to do that, is I want to teach lean to a government somewhere in the world specifically work with the head of state of that country and then develop an amazing culture within that country that it sets an example to the rest of the world of what government government should look like. Do you think the Japanese are closest to that model? No. No, I wouldn't say the Japanese are closest to that model. Uh, 
I would say there's a couple governments in Africa that have, uh, have done some pretty extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. But no, no, I would not say. The Japanese, they're incredible. They're philosophically, their culture is amazing. But they don't need my help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's not the, yeah. the, I mean, their government has some dysfunction. Don't, I'm not trying to say that. But their culture, in my humble opinion, they have all kinds of problems, just like every culture does. But compared to every other culture in the world, it's heaven. Mm -hmm. They're not perfect. They, you, people can say all kinds of bad things about the Japanese, but compared to any other culture in the world. Here's a typical, I'll give you an example of the Japanese. Do we have time for this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's a typical example. You're in Bhutan. I was just in Bhutan. Yeah. And... You're walking down the street and there's Chinese, there's Germans, there's Norwegians, there's Americans, there's French, Vietnamese, and then there's Japanese. The Japanese are so radically different than everybody else. You know what the difference is? Quiet, polite, humble. Yeah. It's the most successful society and economy basically in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. They have more money per capita Everything about their country. Have you been to Japan? No, no, it's, no, no. it's staggering. Hmm. It, it, it's immaculately clean. Everything runs to the second. Hmm. It's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, I take executives from Germany. I take PhDs from Germany. Entire team. And they go, oh my gosh, I can't handle this. It's too crazy. Hmm. They can't even believe what they see. Okay? So you have this country that has this super elevated standard of living and this high level of philosophical thinking and you put them in a crowd in a tourist, tourist environment and the Japanese is humble and quiet. Yeah, go ahead. And the Chinese, the American, the French, the German, <laughs> pushing, shoving, talking loud, blah, blah, spitting, chewing, yeah. pissing on the toilet seat and walking out. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? Yep. They're incredible. Yeah. They're not perfect. Right. But compared to everyone else, they're, they're incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Cool. Why? You, you go into a 7-Eleven, I'll tell you something. You walk into any 7-Eleven in mm -hmm. Japan. You walk into a toilet, you want to go to a toilet in 7-Eleven here, what's it like? Yeah. Come on. You, you'd be yes. afraid, right? Yeah. You'd be afraid. You hold your breath before you walk in. Yeah. You walk into any 7-Eleven in Japan, any convenience store, sparkling clean bidet toilet seat to wash your butt, everything's perfect. Hmm. Not because someone goes in and cleans up after them, because everybody cleans up after themselves. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of respect for one another. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, it's awesome. So they don't need to learn anything from me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. That was awesome. How old are you? I'm 23. What? Yeah. Yeah. I started, I started mowing lawns when I was 11, and I went to college when I was 13, and I was going to go to medical school, but like you, the whole bureaucracy kind of turned me off. So I went to Africa a couple times and did surgeries over there, did birthing, like all sorts of stuff in the medical field, volunteering at orphanages. And then I came back here and it was just, it was just too much. I couldn't handle the paperwork and the insurance and the money side of things, and the, especially the pharmaceutical. So I was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. And I wasn't gonna spend it. Did next. you get your medical degree? No, I did finished my bachelor's pre-med, everything right. was ready. I had applied to medical school and that's when I went to Africa. And then I came back, canceled my application, started in the lawn care business more, and then started my MBA.